to the cloud. Okay, we're gonna start off with a slide deck um, to address frequently asked questions, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A. There is a Q&A uh, forum where you can drop your questions versus dropping your questions in the chat. If you drop your questions in the chat, we're not going to address it there. Please drop it into the Q&A. So I'm going to desktop share. So we can go ahead and get the, desk, the slide deck started. Let me see. Share screen. Here we go. OK, um, so again, MCSDS admissions webinar. Okay, um, first slide deck. Uh, John, do you want to go ahead and address some of these? Sure, sure. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, my name is John Hart. I'm a professor in computer science. I'm the director for professional and online programs in computer science, including the MCSDS uh, on the Coursera platform. Thanks for your interest in, the, um, in this uh, kind of innovative way for us to deliver the MCS uh, degree. Uh, to a wider variety of, uh, of students. The uh, University of Illinois is a land-grant institution. Our mandate is to provide uh, educational opportunity in, in key areas of, uh, of strategic need um, for, you know, for the country and for development uh, to as broad of an audience as possible you know, in the state of Illinois, in, in, in the nation, and, and across the world. And this is a, a great way for us to be able to do this. So. We're anxious to do that and uh, um, anxious to uh, teach you guys about uh, the program. So uh, in terms of uh, applying for the program, um, what are we looking for? Um, uh, we're looking for two things. Um, we get two kinds of applicants. One applicant uh, you know, has a bachelor's degree in a computing field. And then another applicant we have uh, you know, has a bachelor's degree in some other field and they're adding you know the MCS or the MCSDS degree on top of that, uh, similar to adding an MBA or adding a law degree or some other degree, a medical degree, on top of some disciplinary master's degree. And so it's that second, um, you know, second group of students that uh, you know we weren't expecting initially, and we've we've been trying to uh, um, uh, you know make welcome and to uh, make sure that the uh, uh, that are uh, uh, on ramp. Uh, into the degree program uh, uh, is, is suitable for those students, that those students can succeed in, in the program along with the students that have a, a, perhaps a stronger background in computing. So the professional background we're finding is multidisciplinary, and you'll be in classes uh, with students that have a bachelor's degree in computer science or other computing fields, and, and students that have a bachelor's degree in economics or in finance or in chemistry or biology or um, uh, many other fields, uh, English, uh, history, anthropology, we are seeing a huge variety of students coming into the program. Um, and, uh, and also multifunction, you know, people that have been working for a while, people that have just come out of their bachelor's degree as a full-time student, a, a wide range of, uh, uh, of people. And, you know, we've designed the program to be able to work well with, with people while they're working, while they have other life events, while they're raising a family. Um, you know, the video lessons, you can, uh, uh, you can grab a quick video lesson while you're commuting to a job, or you can binge watch all the video lessons over a weekend. It's, uh, it's up to you how you want to do that. Um, but for the background, uh, um, we do require some um, programming experience. You have, to have, you, have to, you have to have done some programming just to be able to get through this. It's a master's degree in computer science. These are 400, 500 level graduate courses in computer science. And there's certain prerequisites that are going to be key. Um, so in order to get a master's degree in computer science, you have to have a bachelor's degree. Um, it doesn't have to be in computing, but it, uh, it does need to include some key prerequisites, uh, especially data structures, um, which is usually a second or third course in computer science. Um, and the GPA, we like to see a GPA of 3.2 or higher on a 4.0 scale. Um, and that 3.2 is usually in the last two years of study. We'll also look at your grades in key computer science classes. Um, so the programming ability that I've been talking about, um, the, the key one is data structures. In, in, in Illinois, this is uh, covered by our course CS225. 
And we have a sequence of CS125, which is an introduction to programming. CS, I think it's 173, which is a discrete mathematics course. Um, and then uh, CS225, which is our data structures course. And if you look at the, uh, you know, you, you can go and find the syllabus and uh, the uh, descriptions of those courses. They'll show up on Google and they're all open. You can see everything there is about those courses. Take a look at those courses and that's the, uh, um, those are the key prerequisites for our 400 level classes that are gonna be required for the MCS uh, DS program. And so um, you have to have that data structures course. You also have, need to have experience with algorithms that you pick up in data structures and programming and also object-oriented design that you'll pick up in an object-oriented programming class. Typically, we like to see students have two classes at least um, uh, prior to applying. One class on, um, on programming, like an introduction to programming that will cover object-oriented programming, usually C++ or Java. Uh, sometimes it's Python or, uh, uh, or R or some other uh, MATLAB, some other language, but we like to see C++ or Java. Um, and, uh, and then uh, a second course in data structures, and, and between the two of those, you usually get the algorithms. So you know which data structure is best for things like searching and sorting, and which algorithms are best for searching and sorting, um, uh, and, uh, and, and various other fundamental computer science uh, topics that way. In terms of mathematical ability, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's important to have linear algebra uh, to be able to work uh, with, with matrices, especially large matrices, sparse matrices, understand not only how to solve matrices, but how to take a problem and express it as a matrix so that uh, when you solve the matrix, you can get the answer to your problem. And that's gonna be fundamental for classes like uh, uh, data mining, classes in data mining and also in machine learning. Um, and then some basic statistics and probability. We have a STATS 400 class, and if you look at the STATS 400 class, that'll give you the kind of background that we're looking for in, in basic statistics and probability. We have an introduction, we have a, a, a statistical programming class, I forget the full name of it, but it's STATS 420 that we offer here on the platform as part of the program. And if you want to bolster your statistics and probability, that's a great way to uh, um, uh, to, to both learn, learn R and, um, and statistical probability programming as well as to bolster your background in statistics and probability. Anything you want to add? Um, no, I think that covers everything. Uh, Christine, do you want to cover some of the questions that are popping up? That are really yeah, let's, um, let's do that. I was going to jump into that. So we had some questions related to the GPA in particular. Um, and some of them, is it is the GPA a hard requirement? Um, some of them have GPAs from 10 years plus. Is that still relevant? Um, can we go ahead and address that? Uh, yeah, you want, you want to give the departmental policy on that? Okay. So um, if your GPA is dated, let's say 10 years old, but that is not going to be um, held against you because we do have a lot of students who come back to school after being in the industry for several years. So if let's say, I think there was, I saw a question, if your GPA bachelor's degree is from 1991, that will be okay. Um, the 3.2 that Professor Hart mentioned is the, the preferred GPA, the expected GPA. The graduate college has a policy of a minimum 3.0 GPA for admissions to the graduate college because you are going to be admitted to the graduate college even though the department is recommending you to admission for admissions. So the graduate college will look at the last two years of coursework and if that is less than 3.0 then there has to be some extraordinary achievements for the graduate college to consider you for admissions. So in that sense, yes, there is a minimum of 3.0 required. And having said that, we will look at your overall application packet. So you may have finished your bachelor's degree 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but you may have also had since then a different master's degree, which where you might have shown that your um, you were able to successfully complete graduate level coursework. Those will be taken into consideration. 
and then anything extraordinary that you have you may have done in the time since you graduated so it's an overall it's a holistic review of the application um, let's see what else are we missing so um, in terms of you know if you if you've had your classes a long time ago and the grades aren't that good um, let me just answer one of these questions there we go um, one of the uh, one of the things you can do if, if your GPA is low um, uh, is that you can take some courses um, you know at a local community college or at, in other places uh, you can take courses uh, non-degree and so on um, but some key computer science courses it's a great way to take data structures if you don't have data structures or you might take some more advanced computer science courses and we'll, we'll consider those as well. And you know, if you do well in those, that's a better indicator than if you did poorly in courses 10 years ago. So uh, you can always improve your GPA and we'll look at your most recent courses and especially your courses most closely related to the major uh, in determining your, your GPA eligibility. So there are some things you can do for that. Um, some students also ask about data structures. Can you satisfy data structures and these other course prerequisites um, you know, with uh, MOOCs on the Coursera platform and, and other, uh, other um, training uh, examples like that? And the answer is yes, we will consider those, but it's more difficult. The best way to, you know, to establish your competency uh, for the prerequisites for these courses is to take them for credit, for a grade, um, someplace, uh, you know, the local community college or, or some other place where the where the you get a transcripted grade. That's that's the strongest way to take these courses. Uh, you can take them on Coursera, and you can um, you need to make sure that you're taking them uh, uh, for a grade that results in the certificate of completion, and then you need to submit that link to the certificate of completion that you receive with your application materials. And you know that will be considered. It's not as strong um, if you is if you took it uh, for credit, um, but uh, we will consider that. Many people, you know, ask if they can use work experience for um, for these competencies, and the answer is no. We we really don't have a way of uh, evaluating work experience. It, it's you can you can put it on the application, but it's not as strong. Um, uh, you know, we have to take your word for it. We can have letter, letters of recommendation address those things, but it's very difficult to establish your, your competency and some of those prerequisites based only on work experience. Um, so the strongest way is to take the courses for credit and, and to include those, uh, those grades when, when you can. Terrific, thank you. I think that covers that. Um, let's go ahead and move no, on to- sorry. Go ahead. Something because there are some questions about um, chickens from certain countries who don't have a GPA. Oh, yeah. Um, so if you do not have a GPA, you can leave that field blank, but make sure when you uh, submit the application that you give us the full copy of your transcript, which shows what, your, what the grading scale is at the particular institute you attended, and our staff will calculate your um, GPA and normalize it. So as long as you give us all the information, including the grades and the grading scale, um, that will be taken care of and you can leave that field blank. Yeah. As a university, about two thirds of our graduate applications come mm -hmm. from outside the US, mm -hmm. uh, from a wide variety of locations. And so we're familiar with handling uh, these issues from all of these different countries. If you go to the graduate college admission pages, I think it's uh, grad.illinois.edu. Um, there's an admissions uh, section and there's specific country information that shows how we process every single country on this planet uh, in terms of, uh, of applications. Um, if you have any detailed questions about that. Okay. Are we ready for the next slide? Okay. There we go. Application requirements. You do this? I can do this. All right. Um, we probably have some of you who have already submitted the application. So it's all online. Um, there, there's a direct link on our on the CS website to go to the application portal. If you're a domestic student, and that includes permanent residence, it's $70 for the application 
monthly and then ninety dollars if you're a, um, if you're an international applicant. Um, we are sorry we are not able to uh, make application fee waivers unless you qualify for some waivers that are available at the graduate college. And if you have specific questions, you can ask us, or there's also information on the graduate college about those waivers. The part, what you will need to submit for the application. So, John, do you want to talk about the letters of recommendation and then pick up? Sure, sure. Um, in general, we'll be looking at your, uh, at your transcripts, and there are key questions in the application, things that ask you about data structures. Do you have a class? Um, and, and when you enter that, it's important to enter the, the class uh, number when you took the class, and then we can verify that in your transcript. But enter what class you took for data structures and when you took it, what class you took for um, algorithms and when you took it, what class you took for object oriented programming and linear algebra and so on. Enter those in, in those classes if you're, if you're using a, a Coursera uh, or other uh, uh, online uh, MOOC uh, to satisfy that, enter the, um, uh, the, the link to the certificate. If you, if you did some work on that, um, then we may refer to some letters of recommendation. Um, in, in that case, um, you can include some letters of recommendation if you want. What we will look for those is if those letters of recommendation are specifically addressing um, some aspect of, of work performance that we, you want us to consider or, or some other aspect of your uh, uh, performance. It could be in classes as well, but usually the class is sufficient. The fact that you took the class and got a grade is sufficient for that proficiency. So you don't need to include letters of recommendation. They're not required, um, and, and, and we'll look at them. Uh, largely if there's some uh, prerequisite that's that's not handled by a course of some sort and we need to address that and, and then it's really important to have solid um, quantitative uh, some you know some indication of your competency in, in a particular field um, that, that we can rely on in, in lieu of a grade um, that that's um, that's a harder way to get competency it's much easier just to have a course and a grade but um, we can use those letters of recommendation for that. Right, so thank you. Yeah, and then same with the statement and purpose and the CV and, and resume. The CV and resume are useful because we can look at, uh, at your work experience and we can, we can see where you uh, went. The statement of purpose is, uh, is uh, um, um, you're free to include it, but it, it's not a major factor in the consideration for, uh, uh, for the degree. So I would um, like to add a little bit of information about your CV or resume, and this is particularly important if you are um, what the graduate would college would consider as an international applicant for admission purposes. Um, actually, let me just skip that, go on to transcripts. Um, so transcripts, we only require unofficial transcripts for review purposes. So as part of your application, you will submit transcripts, um, scanned PDF copies, make sure that they are clean, um, scanned copies and legible. Um, we would want to see all the grades and then the transcripts also have, a part of the transcript includes a grade scheme or the- um, um, Scale. The, the scale, thank you, Christine. So sometimes this is on the back of the pages, in particular, if you look at a US transcript, it's usually on the back of the transcripts or there's a page at the end of the document. If you're looking at some of the um, overseas transcripts, and they, uh, they have a separate page. So make sure you include that scale, which we need to calculate the GPAs. And even if you, even if you might enter a GPA, um, we will actually, we will recalculate or check those GPAs based on your transcripts. Um, could I add? Could I add one thing to that, Vivica? Um, so for the transcripts, please make sure that the institution's name is visible on the transcript, and also that um, your degree conferral date is on the transcript. And if you so, what happens if you are admitted is then we will ask the graduate college will ask for official transcripts. So at this point. At this point of time, your, your uh, focus should be to get us clean, complete transcripts. And if you're admitted, then the graduate college will let you know 
what exactly you need because you need to see the full transcript plus the date that the degree has been awarded as Christine just mentioned. So depending on which university you graduated from, this could be one document or two documents, but we'll, uh, you will receive that information. Um, so the standardized tests, GRE, GMAT are not required. These are not required for any of our graduate programs. If you have taken them, you can attach a scanned PDF copy as part of your application. You do not need to send official scores to us um, because it's not required. Now, if you are an international student, there are a couple of things that you could do. The, there are admissions requirements for international applicants. You, will, you can either submit TOEFL or IELTS scores. And on this slide, we have the scores that are needed. If it is TOEFL IBT, then you need 103 or higher for full status admissions. Um, and then the same with IELTS, you have to have 6.5 or higher in the total area with uh, more than six in all bands. The scores, if you're using the scores for admissions, it, the scores have to be less than two years old and that is the time period that they are valid. So this is one way of meeting the admissions requirements. And a lot of our students and applicants in this program have either been in um, countries where you would usually have a waiver from the, from the TOEFL IELTS course because of their work experience. If you have been, for example, working in the US or in UK or Australia for more than two years, you can ask for an exemption from this waiver, from this requirement. And for that purpose, we would really like you to include all the information in your resumes or CVs, including your location. Because if we can see in your resume that you have been working in the US, physically located in the US, for example, for five years, then we can let you know that you have a waiver. That's why I wanted to go back to the resume. So let's say you're, you've been working at Microsoft in the US for three years, then please let us know that where you were located. If you have had a degree earned from one of the eligible countries in the last five years, then you also have a waiver from these TOEFL requirements, even if you're an international applicant. So please go to our website. We have provided a lot of information on the C computer science website about how to meet these requirements. Um, perhaps we can post that link, Christine, on the chat space to our admissions page and look at the um, application requirements for international students with these details. If you have any questions, you can send us an email at ncs-ds at cs.illinois.edu and um, Christine mostly would get back to you with that. Yep. Yeah, we'll have the list of links at the, the last slide. Okay, let me, uh, let me just follow up. Uh, the application fee is important. Um, uh, our application system, you can fill out the application, but please understand that we will not evaluate your application unless um, you include that fee. Um, the application uh, processing uh, includes a lot of work that goes into verifying the uh, transcripts and uh, getting everything into a uniform system so that we can evaluate everybody fairly. So there's a lot of work that goes into each uh, application that, that we examine. We examine these applications holistically. We, we look at uh, a lot of uh, attributes for students. Um, and that's what that application fee covers. And we will not uh, evaluate the application um, if that application fee is not there. So, so just be aware of that. Uh, in case you submit your application, don't submit the application fee and don't hear from us. It's because your application has not been completed. And just as a tag along on that, you, you really need to make the payment by the posted deadline as yeah. well. So the yeah. application, the department will not consider the application complete unless you have submitted the application and uh, made the payment by the deadline. So if you are looking at 
um, applying for summer, then our deadlines for summer MCSDS applications would be coming up on February 15th. So that's 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 the deadline to hit. Okay. Okay. Great. I, I'm also seeing a lot of questions about the bachelor's degree. You have to have a bachelor's degree. We cannot give the university will not let us give you a master's degree if you don't have a bachelor's degree. Okay. So that's going to be a hard uh, requirement. Okay, next slide um, goes over tuition and financial aid. Um, Vivica or John? Go ahead, Vivica. All right, so um, the tuition is pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, it's $600 per credit hour earned, and the degree program has a requirement of 32 credit hours, coming to a total of $19,200 for your tuition. There's there's a, there are some additional fees, like any other uh, graduate program. If you go to a grad program, you most of the time end up purchasing some textbooks, other um, software that you might need, portal usage. So there are some fees that go with the, uh, and, and also for proctoring your exams, because the exams in the degree program are proctored. They, we use an online proctoring service, and there are some fees associated with that. Um, that information is also available on our website. That's, it's, a, it's a range because there may be some classes that have a midterm, whereas other classes may not have a midterm. So there's a little bit of variance in how the assessments are done for each class. We also get questions about financial aid. Um, the department is not able to offer graduate teaching assistantships or graduate research assistantships to students in our online programs. So this is for all our online programs, including MCSDS. But if you qualify for financial aid, domestic students can um, qualify for financial aid. It's, a, it's an accredited program. You can um, go through the standard process of applying using the FAFSA forms. Okay. Um, uh, we, we get this question a lot. The department does not have any financial aid for any students in, in these online programs, including the MCSDS, so uh, uh, it's just not something we're able to provide. Um, and, uh, but it is an accredited program, so it is eligible for you know, uh, student loans and, and financial aid uh, opportunities. Uh, you know, your particular country may have financial aid for you for an accredited program. This, this program is accredited um, accredited by the agency that accredits the entire University of Illinois, um, and it's it's a um, it, it's a it results in a master's degree uh, in in computer science, the same master's degree that students get in our other online program and our for our on campus students. Um, the, the degree doesn't show say anything about online. None of the transcripts will say anything about online. Um, what you are is a is a University of Illinois student. Uh, receiving a master's degree from the University of Illinois. Then the last bullet item on this slide is if you, if you, for example, if you are a scholarship recipient, if you have another agency that is um, sponsoring you, there is third party or sponsor billing available through the university. You just you would need to um, sign up for that, or your sponsor needs to do some paperwork, sign up for that, and it is possible to have your sponsor directly billed for all your tuition and um, the tuition charges. Um, there, there is, we can point you to that information if you're admitted and if you want to make use of this, um, this service. I think I saw another question about can I pay in um, installments? There's, there is, a, um, you can sign up for a payment plan. Um, there's a minimum bill amount which you as a graduate student, if you take one class, we will pass. So you can sign up for a, for a payment plan. And you only pay for the tuition that you are registered for a particular semester. So it's not an upfront program bill, but it is a semester, semester by semester assessment of tuition. Okay, excellent. We have some um, anxious attendees uh, wanting to ask, um, have their questions addressed about coursework um, and course format. So um, that concludes the slide deck. We, um, I 
right now projecting um, our important links. So if everybody, if you're able to take a screenshot, if you want to take a screenshot of that, so you have it for reference. Otherwise, you can always go to the MCSDS website. A quick Google of MCSDS will take you directly to our web page. I believe uh, uh, that application link, is that the correct one? Is that the correct I, one or is that the old one? Yeah, I think that's the old one. So just okay. go to I'll chat. I'll put it in the chat once I stop sharing here. Okay. Okay, no. okay so um, John, could you go ahead and just um, describe some of the, the courses that are in the program, if you, you don't bet. You bet. Yeah, I just saw a question uh, asking, will this, um, will this be too easy for somebody mm -hmm. that has two years of data science experience? And the answer is no. <laughs> uh, these are graduate level computer science courses. Um, uh, our computer science department is, is one of the top five programs uh, uh, in computer science. And you, you'll be learning co um, computer science topics from the people that write the textbooks that other people at other universities use, uh, including, including our, ourselves. Um, and so, uh, um, and, and in fact, uh, in, in several cases, you, you can get uh, advanced versions of books that other students won't have the opportunity to get until you know, those, those courses uh, adopt those books. Um, and, uh, and so this is, uh, the, the courses are very detailed. You take eight courses. Uh, four of those courses need to cover core areas in data science and in computer science. Those areas are data mining, cloud computing, data visualization, and machine learning. And so for data visualization and machine learning, there's one course each that you'll be better required. The, the data visualization course that we offer in the summer, and the applied machine learning course that we're rolling out for the, um, the, the spring semester and, and subsequently. Uh, so that machine learning course and the data visualization courses will be offered once per year, so you need to keep an eye out for them to be able to take those. Uh, for cloud computing, you can take um, uh, cloud computing concepts, uh, which is CS425, which is a cloud computing version of distributed computing. Um, and that's that's a very CS heavy course. That's that's a course that's um, uh, usually I recommend for students that have a computing bachelor's degree. Uh, the other course you can take is cloud computing applications, and um, uh, the cloud computing concepts is kind of the foundations of, of cloud computing, how to set up uh, cloud computing services, and cloud computing applications is how to write applications programs um, on the cloud. For delivery for using those cloud services. That cloud computing applications course, uh, CC, uh, at CS 498 CCA, is one that I recommend for students that, um, uh, that don't have a, uh, a computer science background necessarily. It's, it's a bit more approachable and, and also usually what they're looking for when they're wanting to apply data science and, uh, with a computer science degree uh, to a particular discipline. Uh, similarly, we've got data mining. We've got two courses, text information systems, and um, uh, 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 CS, that's CS410, and CS412, which is actual data mining. Text information systems is a bit more approachable, especially for people outside of computer science that don't have a computer science undergraduate degree. Data mining, uh, CS412, is, is a much harder course requires a lot more linear algebra and, uh, and computer science background. And so uh, just give you a heads up on that. In addition to those requirements, you need to take three other courses. And these three other courses are 500 level courses. Those are courses that are only allowed for graduate students. They're at the highest level we have in, um, at the university. And those courses are, um, uh, we have courses in, um, in the iSchool um, on information science. We have a course on data curation. We have a course on data cleaning. We have some stats courses, a, a stats course on machine learning that's, that's quite advanced, and also a stats course on uh, Bayesian uh, uh, statistics. Uh, and then we have some capstone courses that satisfy that 500 level requirement, a capstone in cloud computing and a capstone in um, uh, data mining. If you want to take those capstones, you have to take both of the data mining courses or both of the cloud computing caps, uh, courses in order to uh, qualify for that capstone. 
So there's some opportunities to specialize in particular areas of data science, but also a requirement uh, uh, that you, you've got a, a broad knowledge of, uh, of these aspects across, uh, uh, across data science. Great, thank you. Okay, um, I have a, there's a question here. Um, I already have a master's degree in a computer science in computer science from a US university. Will the credits for common courses that I've finished as part of a previous degree transfer to this program? I graduated in 2011. Good question. If, if you already have a master's degree in computing, uh, computer science or closely related field, we cannot give you a second master's degree in that same field. Um, if you have a master's, if, if you've taken coursework as part of a master's degree in something that's sufficiently different from a master of computer science, say you have a master's degree in history or economics or you know, some other area, um, then you, can, um, you can't count, you cannot transfer in coursework that counted towards that master's degree, towards the second master's degree. Um, if you have additional coursework that you've done, we can transfer in up to 12 courses if, they sufficient, if, they're, at the, um, if they're at the appropriate level for a master's of computer science. But you can't have used those courses for a different uh, degree that you received. Did sure. I get that right? Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Um, here's a question. What's the difference between Coursera, eight courses in this program, off, wait, okay. What's the difference between Coursera eight courses this program, program offers versus Coursera's eight courses taken by myself? Good Very question. good question. So we do not give course credit, university uh, credit for a, um, for a Coursera MOOC. Mm -hmm. uh, the Coursera MOOCs contain the, um, uh, the lectures, uh, the video lessons that represent the lectures of our classes. And they will have exercises uh, and, and some, some projects that, uh, that are appropriate for global learners, um, but they are not at the depth of the assessments and, um, and the interactions with teaching staff needed to get through those assessments, the midterm and the final, uh, and also some, some more significant programming projects that we have for each of the classes. And that's what you need to satisfy in order to get uh, university credit um, in a four credit offering of one of our classes. So um, the MOOCs represent uh, basically the lecture portion of the classes, but what's missing from those MOOCs is, is the uh, midterm finals, programming projects, and in interactions with the, uh, with the staff needed to be able to get through them. Um, if you were to come on campus and sit in on a course, you can audit one of our courses on campus. You can, you can join the class. Uh, um, by sitting and listening to the lectures. That's a similar experience to what you get from taking a Coursera MOOC versus actually registering for the class, being admitted to the University of Illinois, and then going through the actual formal assessments that we have in the class. That, that's what you get graded for and, and what you get university course credit for. Terrific, thank you. Let's see, next question. Um... Are there any optional courses for things like operating systems and full stack web development? Yes, we're working on that. Uh, right now we have an MCS that's focused on data science and we're working on generalizing this um, and adding other uh, emphases and so on. So stay tuned. Um, uh, it's something we're working on, but haven't, uh, our, there's nothing that's been announced on that yet. Okay. Another question, do we have to pay Coursera subscription fees in addition to the tuition? Yes, um, for each course and <laughs> um, you have to, uh, each course that we have, um, the lecture portion is represented by two Coursera MOOCs. Um, and so you will need to register for those Coursera MOOCs and pay the Coursera fees separately from your tuition. So each, the tuition for each course will be about $2,400. And in addition to that, you'll need to pay two times $79, which is $158 um, to register for each Coursera MOOC uh, accompanying the course. Um, and then on top of that, any proctoring fees and any cloud computing fees that you might need to, uh, to spend. Okay. And, uh, that, let me also add, you know, nobody likes these additional fees that you have. Um, these fees are substantially reduced from the fees we charge for our on-campus students and, you know, 
Um, and that's something to keep in mind. Um, uh, and it's, it's part of, you know, uh, we, we've, we've tried to arrange this to keep the overall costs very affordable uh, with, the, with the lower tuition, but those fees are a necessary part of it. And so um, the tuition itself is $19,200 when you start adding in those fees. That can be another two, dollars $3,000 on top of that. So the total cost would be two to three, $22,000, dollars $23,000. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to factor in things like books and other uh, materials you may need. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, what is the support like for the more in-depth programming assignments? Uh, we, we assign the same TAs for these courses as we would assign for an on-campus course. And so you will be able to reach out to the TAs and the teaching staff for the help that you'll need to get through these very difficult programming problems. Um, you will also be using um, the same bulletin board system to communicate with the course staff as our on-campus students. Um, you'll also have each other. And um, student-to-student uh, -student communication has been very helpful in helping students work through problems. We're instrumented for that, both on campus and in our online programs to allow students to help each other through these online bulletin boards. We've got many modes where students can cooperate on um, understanding the, the fundamentals needed to, to work on each problem. Um, and in, in many cases, you'll be communicating with our on-campus students and everybody that's taking the class, uh, either online or on campus, um, in, in many cases, will be communicating through the same uh, um, uh, uh, systems to, to be able to coordinate and ask questions and get questions answered. Uh, with that said, you, you will need to do your own work for these problems. And uh, we, we're very careful to um, make students aware that they have to do their own work um, when you get a grade, that grade needs to be for your work and, and you know, we detect plagiarism and, and copying code and so on. So that's something that we're very cognizant of and, and we want to make sure that everybody uh, uh, is treated fairly. It's unfair for students that work very hard on, on programs if other students in the class are cheating. Great. Okay. Um, is this master's degree recognized as a master's degree directly taken in the University of Illinois, and then I'm going to combine that with, um, does it is it eligible for a PhD to go towards a PhD? Why don't you take the first one? So yes, so this is um, it's, this is an accredited master's a master in com master of computer science degree offered offered by the university. It has um, gone through the same review processes for accreditation, and yes, it is considered a. a Added approved Master of Computer Science degree in computer science. Yeah. yeah, there's no difference in the degree on the transcript or on the diploma for our on-campus students getting the MCS or our online students getting the MCS. We've we've been teaching this. Uh, we've been offering this degree online since the '90s, and um, you know we we've been very careful about uh, um, ensuring that uh, that our degrees are evaluated uh, on merit and not based on the mode of delivery. In terms of the PhD program, this is this is what's called a professional master's degree. Um, it's it's coursework based. It doesn't require a thesis. Um, you don't work with a, a faculty advisor on writing a thesis, and there's no real research component. Uh, uh, the capstones work on projects um, and read research papers, but that's that's the limits of of uh, that. So if you want to work with an advisor on a research project and get a PhD, um, you can apply directly to the PhD program. We, we don't require a master's degree in order to apply for the PhD program. You can go straight from a bachelor's degree to a PhD uh, program. Uh, and there's also a master's of science, uh, which is uh, a research-based uh, master's degree where you would be working with an advisor to write a master's thesis. Um, you're free to apply to both of those. Those are only on-campus uh, programs. You don't have online versions of either of those. And the uh, admissions criterion is, um, is, um, is much more stringent because we have to pair students up with advisors and the level of competition for those programs is, is very high, very fierce. It's, uh, it's a top-ranked program and, um, and uh, we have to be very selective. Uh, in the pairing up of students with advisors and so on. But um, uh, everybody's welcome to apply for those programs. It's just a different program than the coursework-based program that leads to the, uh, to the Master of Computer Science. 
Perfect. Okay. I'm going to combine another couple questions. Um, what accommodations are in place for working professionals taking classes and how long um, should students expect um, to take to complete the 32 credit hours? All right, let me do the first one. You can do the second one. So the first one, you know, we, we've organized the program. That's one of the, the real uh, benefits of online education. This is asynchronous, um, remote uh, location, uh, uh, location, online education. Um, you can, you can, you know, um, uh, do the assignments as needed. There's often target dates for the assignments, especially when they're TA graded. So you have to be sensitive to the deadlines for your assignments, but the assignments are available, um, well in advance. Um, so it, you know, if you're, if you, if you have a, a tougher schedule, if you have other things that, that may pop up at work or at home, I'd recommend, um, doing the assignments well ahead of the deadline. That's the best advice I can give anybody, both on campus and uh, and online, is do the assignments um, in advance. Uh, try to try to work ahead. Try to get the assignments done as soon as you can, instead of waiting to the last minute. All of us wait to the last minute. It's it's human nature, but uh, it's also dangerous, especially when you've got other other concerns. Otherwise, um, you know the program is is asynchronous. You can. Um, you can catch lessons and, and communicate uh, um, as, as you're able to. Um, we try to op we operate on a semester schedule that works week by week, but within that week, there's a lot of flexibility. And if you have to miss a week or two, um, just let us know, and, and we can make whatever accommodations are necessary to um, to do that as long as we know well enough in advance. Um, and that's kind of what the what the program was designed to do is to work with people that have you know careers, life, family, other other obligations that they have to take care of. Um, and then you want to do the other one. So and and also to add to that, let's say you know ahead of time that the fall semester is not going to work for you to take classes because of your work commitments and other commitments. And we can certainly work with you for you to take that semester off from the program. You do not have to be registered. You do not have to be reapplying there's a mechanism in place where you can take the semester off if it is needed for for reasonable um, purposes in terms of how long can you take and how long it takes to finish the degree if you register now uh, in let's say in the summer it is possible for you to graduate within a 12-month period the classes are available to finish all the requirements but that means you will be taking classes as a full-time student. If that is what you want to do, and if you can do that, then it's at the minimum 12 months, but the university allows five years for students to graduate out of the master's degree. So you have from the time you start five years, and this includes if you take, say, a semester or two off, the initial cycle is set to five years, and if there are extenuating circumstances, students can uh, appeal to the department to have some extra time. But that's the normal time period we look at for master's students. And on average, um, obviously the MCSDS program is relatively new, but on average our online students finish the degree in about three to three and a half years because most of our online students are working professionals, they have family obligations, and they are part-time students. Mm -hmm. I see another question also, does the degree, do the degree courses count towards a doctoral CS program? Um, so the MCS is, um, uh, typically people take the MCS and, and don't go on for a PhD. Um, the MCS will show that, you know, will show your competence in completing the same classes that our PhD students would take, um, the same graduate level classes. But, um, um, often if you want to take a master's degree to prepare for a PhD, uh, it might be more appropriate to get the uh, Master of Science in Computer Science, um, or just a Master of Science offered by the Computer Science Department because that has a thesis component uh, and the research component that we're often looking for for PhD work in computer science. Okay, um, let's see, here's a programming question. Can experience with non-object programming, such as SAS, BASE, and ADVANCE, be substituted for C++, Java? No, um, not really. The, um, you know, I get, a, I get this question a lot. I get a lot of applications that, that you know, show uh, some real, uh, real good work using SAS and SQL and, and some of these other languages. 
Um, but those those languages are uh, you know query languages, statistical analysis languages, and so on. They're at a very high level, and there's a lot of really good work that happens uh, in information systems and data processing and, and data analysis that works at that very high level. But um, um, when you, for example, when you do data mining, when you take our data mining class, you're not learning how to uh, operate a system that does data mining. You're learning how to implement the algorithms used in that system for data mining. And in order to do that, you really need a low level language. You, you really should understand um, the programming in an object oriented language at like C or Java to get to, to, to understand the fundamentals of that. Um, instead of you know calling uh, library routines that do that for you to understand how those library routines actually work. That's the, um, if you look at a data scientist, the average salaries for data scientists uh, are somewhere around $120,000 a year. Maybe it's $140,000 a year, I forget, but six figures. If you look at a data analyst, the data analyst averages sixty dollars to $70,000 a year, and this is from Glassdoor. And one of the big differences is your ability to handle large data sets, to be able to handle data scientifically, and to be able to use scientific instruments in order to um, work on that data. The scientific instrument here is computation, and you really need um, you know, the computing necessary to, to do the machine learning, data mining, um, and uh, uh, on the cloud and, and other uh, large data uh, uh, tools for that. Um, and it's the computer science that gives you the background in that instrument. So um, that, that's why we require the, the low level computer science and why it's been so, so effective at, uh, at training data scientists for this. Okay, thank you. Um, here's one. On average, um, how much time should one dedicate every day in order to complete the course, to complete in two years? Or in general? Um, <laughs> uh, each, each course should be uh, 10 to 12 hours. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, so if you want to finish in two years, you would be taking four courses a year. That'd be one or two courses per semester, including the summer. So fall, spring, and summer. Um, so 10 to 20 hours a week. Okay, perfect. Uh, hours a week per class, for four credit hour class. Well, usually for each four quarter credit hour class, it's 10 to 12 hours, right, but right. that, yeah, yeah, that will uh, vary also. And so um, that's an average. Um, when you've got a programming assignment due or you're cramming for an exam, it may be more than 12 hours. Uh, in the first weeks of the class, it may be less. So, um, but we typically, uh, we, we try to aim for 10 to 12 hours per class. Okay. Um, here's a demographic one. What is the average age of students in this program? I don't think we've averaged that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did see this. Uh, it's, it's in the 30s, the mid 30s. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like 35 or 36. Okay. That's probably about right. Yeah. Um, okay. What? With a, with a wide range. With a wide range, yes. Um, what are the challenges that someone with a master's degree in statistics should expect from this program? Uh, if you have your master's degree in statistics, um, the uh, I think the biggest challenge will probably be the programming. If you don't have, um, you know, if you've worked at, um, with statistical software and statistical languages and things like R and MATLAB and, and others, uh, SAS and, 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 and so on, um, I think the bigger challenge will be learning the, um, and using the, the tools and languages like in, in C++ and Java. Okay. Um, here's one about resources. What university resources will I have access to? Will I have access to career services, library, or jobs, internships, internships, or tutors? Yes, uh, we're, we're working on, on some of these. You have the, the biggest resource you have that uh, we, we see the most benefit from is the library. You'll have access to the library. You will have uh, electronic access to every, you know, practically every journal in computing. Uh, and data science, uh, which is really valuable. Um, you, you have the same access as, as any other student on our campus to, to those facilities. Um, and we all, you know, none of us go to the library anymore. We just access it electronically. The, uh, um, there are, uh, we're working on services for, for careers and, and so on. Um, our students on campus uh, access career services through, uh, but have to pay a fee for that. 
Uh, this is an additional fee tacked on on top of their tuition. Um, our online students are not assessed that fee because many of our online students already, you know, um, are getting the degree for advancement, advancement within their uh, company and, and don't necessarily need those job services. We don't want to charge things for uh, to people for uh, we, we don't want to charge fees for students if they if they don't need them. Um, but there, we have um, we have provided access for those career services to our online students as well. Instead of paying a mandatory fee for those, that's an opt-in fee, and um, there's communication about how to how to get um, uh, connected up with those career services. And you know, we, uh, we have employers beating down our doors for access to our students, and and you know, we want to be able to provide the connection of our uh, of our students to those employers looking for. Uh, you know, for the strong students coming out of these programs. But, um, uh, you know, that uh, uh, making those connections requires staff and, and that staff is funded through those fees. Okay, perfect. Um, I think we have quite, uh, room for one more question. Um, if I have a Coursera cert certification for completing, for example, the cloud computing specialization that is part of the master's program, does any of that work carry over if I then officially enroll into the master's program? Yes and no. <laughs> well, the yes part is if you if you have completed the certificate and you enroll in the credit bearing course, then the work that you had completed to the certificate will roll over to your um, to your credit bearing course. Um, you can you can use that the content that you have already completed, but then you will have additional components because you are now a degree seeking student earning graduate credit. So yes and no in the sense, it's not fully um, meeting the requirements, but you will not, you will use those in addition to the other requirements. Right, you don't have to rewatch the videos, but you can, you will have access to the videos if you need to refresh on anything. Um, the quizzes, if you've already taken the quizzes, you don't have to retake the quizzes and any assignments you've done for the, uh, for the uh, for the uh, specialization sequence uh, will carry over, but you'll still have to take the midterms, the finals, and do these other programming projects that are assigned for credit that uh, aren't part of that uh, certificate process. So the, there's some substantial work still to do, but you definitely have a head start. And what you need to, if I may add, what you need to remember is if you're taking the certificate class, maybe there's a little bit of wiggle room in meeting those deadlines, but in the degree program the deadlines that will be posted for various assignments and exams, mm -hmm. those are hard deadlines and mm -hmm. need to be met. Um, if there are, if for example, if a student is sick and unable to take an exam, or those, those can be submitted as requests to the instructional staff faculty, but in general, deadlines need to be planned for. Yep. And it looks like an anonymous mm -hmm. attendee just wrote a short novel uh, for the question, but they're they're self-taught. They have an undergraduate degree, so have a bachelor's degree, self-taught, and have completed some Coursera specializations that we will consider. So when you apply, um, uh, if if you don't have actual coursework in these things, but if if you have completed um, uh, uh, MOOC uh, specialization sequences, as in these things or MOOC courses, include the uh, in include the appropriate link to the certificate you received. Um, that you completed those and we will consider those, but um, they aren't uh, considered as strong as uh, actual coursework uh, for credit uh, that's graded um, by an accredited institution. So, so um, just recognize that. Okay, so that brings We're us... Seeing all these applications, there's some really interesting people uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Q and A and I'm, I'm kind of anxious to see the apps. Yeah, so that brings us to the end of the session. Um, this, this was recorded. Uh, we will go ahead and share out the recording for those of you who did register. We apologize, we couldn't get to all of the questions, um, but hopefully it was helpful. Um, so thanks, John and Vivica, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. Great, thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Thank